So welcome back to this uh, series of videos on uh, fitting regression models <coughs> in R. And uh, I'm going to wrap up this series by talking about uh, model selection. So um, kind of thinking about to kind of uh, step back and think about what the model selection problem is and uh, why we don't just always fit the model, choose the model that has the best R squared. Uh, this is a simple, this is a simulated experiment, but it kind of shows uh, an important principle uh, in terms of how different uncertainties trade off with each other in models. So, it, so this was generated by uh, taking a data set and, and fitting, you know, increasing the number of predictor variables. So I fit with, start with just fitting one predictor, you know, fit with just the mean, uh, then a, you know, linear regression and a, a bivariate and three variables, four variables, five variables, six variables, seven variables, you know, all the way up to fitting, you know, 60 some odd variables to make the prediction. Uh, when we do this, we see that as I add more and more predictor variables, uh, the R squared, the, the, the variance goes down. So the root mean squared error keeps going down. As the root mean squared error goes down, the R squared goes up. And in fact, there's a uh, actually kind of simple mathematical relationship between R squared and, and root mean squared error, uh, as long as you know the total variance in, in Y. Um, and so, um, at, you know, adding more complexity always made a better fit. Uh, but we want to think of when we think about model selection, there's this kind of idea of parsimony, or, or you know, also the idea of Occam's razor. You want to choose uh, the model that has has sufficient complexity to describe your data, but not more complexity than you need. You want the simplest explanation. The simplest explanation for something is best. Um, the other thing to note there is, you know, as you add more and more variables, you know, your rate of your your chance of false positives keeps going up more and more uh, because you, you know, you know, is there actually, you know, seventy things predicting, you know, this response? Uh, you know, it's clearly indicating that, you know, probably not. Uh, the other thing that's important to note about uncertainty is that the residual uncertainty isn't the only uncertainty you need to worry about within a, within a regression. Uh, and so the other thing that, that's depicted here is the parameter uncertainty. So if I start with a data set and I fit a, just a mean, I get an estimate of the standard error of that mean, so how, how well do I know uh, that mean? Uh, and let's say I have a thousand data points and I get an estimate of the mean. Uh, if I then go from fitting a mean to fitting a linear regression, uh, I'm now estimating five, uh, of estimating two parameters from a thousand data points. And so effectively, it's kind of like saying I have 500 pieces of information each. It's not actually what it's doing, but you kind of, kind of can imagine that the information content that you're using to estimate the slope of the intercept is kind of getting divided up because uh, you have to estimate two things, and that's actually going to be reflected in the in the standard error. So the, the the total standard error over those two parameters is going to be higher. So the total parameter uncertainty went up because you have less information per parameter. The total information stays the same. You have more parameters, so you have less information per parameter. If I fit you know a model with three parameters, I now have you know the the information's dividing up three ways, I have less information before, for, per each parameter. And so as I increase the number of parameters in the model, I have less and less information per each data point. And so if you imagine the limit, if I had a thousand, uh, if I had, let's say I fit a polynomial to a data set that had a thousand parameters and a thousand data points, at that point, I'm, I've stopped doing statistics and I'm now doing algebra again. Uh, the line will fit through the data perfectly the residual error will go to zero. Uh, but at the same time, I'm trying to estimate a thousand parameters from a thousand data points. Uh, my standard error on the parameters goes to infinity. Uh, and so in the limit, uh, you know, the, 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 param the residual error just went to zero, but the total error, this combination of parameter error and residual error just went to infinity. 
And so it's clearly not a good fitting model if the total error, say if you wanted to make a prediction into the future, you're, 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 you'd have infinite error on your prediction. So if I'm interested in you know, judging how much understanding I actually have of the system, and particularly if I'm interested in judging uh, how good my predictions are gonna be, I'm interested not just in that residual error, how much did I explain, but I'm interested in that total error. And so this green line indicates the total error in the model. And you can see that as I add complexity, uh, the total error initially goes down, but then at some point, the, to it, the total error goes, starts going back up again. Uh, and that's a reflection of the fact that even though the, re the residual error is going down, it's going down more slowly than the parameter error is going up. And that's always gonna happen at some point. So the idea of model selection is, is often to say, you know, how do I balance off this trade-off between complexity and, and model fit? Uh, how do I bait, you know, trade off these different uncertainties uh, within my model? And so there's a bunch of different ways out there to do that. I'm gonna focus on uh, a, a particular, uh, very common model selection metric called AIC. AIC stands for IACI's Information Criteria. It's based on information theory. I'm not gonna derive it. Um, but the idea is it, it, it's a calculation of uh, essentially the information uh, content. And uh, the way the scoring is set up is this is a score where, where lowest score wins. And so what I've put in this table is uh, what we would call an example of forward selection. We started with our, our best single variable model, our best two variable model, our best three variable model, and our full model. And I can calculate this AIC for each of these and we can see um, you know, yes, the R squared down, but in this case, the AIC actually goes down each time as well. Um, and then because the, the, the specific numerical value of an AIC doesn't actually matter, uh, what really matters is the relative values. What we often do is normalize the AIC relative to the best fitting model. So the full model is given zero because it was the best fitting model. And then the, all the other ones we see, we calculate the difference in AIC between the best fitting model and the model the, and, and, the, uh, and that particular model. Uh, now these scores actually we can give some interpretation to. Um, and you know, the general rule of thumb is that you know, an AIC difference, a delta AIC bigger than five is usually considered uh, to be you know, strong support uh, for you know, a, a model. You know, if it's an improvement, or I would say in the opposite direction, you know, if if the delta AIC is bigger than five, you know, that your your uh, your best fitting model is kind of you know significantly better. Uh, kind of in the the two to five range is often considered weak support, and a delta AIC less than two is usually often considered to say that models are kind of can be treated equivalently. There's not really um, a difference between the two. Um, some other ways of thinking about model selection, there's also the ways of thinking about doing by backward elimination, starting with a full model and then dropping the least significant terms. Uh, I would generally recommend against uh, algorithms that calculate you know, lots of different models. You know, uh, either of these approaches is not guaranteed to find the lowest AIC, but again, you have to balance uh, this against um, the risk of overfitting. Again, the more tests you do, the more like the higher likelihood of false positives. And there are folks that would would definitely you know argue against ever doing forward selection or backward elimination at all. You know, there are folks who would argue just say, you know, here are my hypothesized models. I'm going to only put out the hypothesized models and test them, and then I'm done. Um, The nice thing about AIC is that we, it, it works not just with linear models, but it'll also be something that will lurk, lurk, will work as a way of modeling, comparing models when we move on to more complex models beyond linear models, either you know non-Gaussian models or non-non-linear models or more complex uh, process-based models. Uh, also noting that that within R you can get the AIC from uh, any linear model by just passing the linear model object that came out of the, the fit 
uh, to the AIC function. So it's capital AIC and it gives you that AIC score. So pretty handy, pretty simple. And again, lowest score wins. Uh, you can always compare models based on AIC, even if they're the same complexity. Uh, you cannot compare models of different complexity using things like R squared because R squared is not giving the appropriate penalty uh, in model selection for complexity. It's not accounting for the fact that you're now fitting model parameters. Your, your R squared always goes down when you add more parameters, but that doesn't mean you've got a better fit model. Your, your total error may be going up. Thanks, and that's gonna wrap up. At this point, I'm gonna wrap up this specific series of videos on uh, linear models. Um, if, you, if you remember uh, uh, back a bit, I, I, when I laid out the overall step, steps for uh, linear models, you can start with hypotheses, exploratory analysis, uh, univariate models, you know, multivariate, you know, checking for collinearity, multivariate models, model selection. There was actually a last step on model evaluation, and I'm going to uh, defer that to actually the next video series because I'm going to actually talk about model uh, evaluation more broadly, for models more broadly, not just statistical models, and then end that uh, video series uh, with um, some of the things that are, are unique to uh, evaluating statistical models that are just that are different from evaluating models more generally. So I want to again dive into a discussion of model evaluation before I dive into statistical model evaluation. I'll see you then.